Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, my name is John Findlay and this is the latest in a series of webinars being given by the Grand Source Heat Pump Association. Uh, the title of my uh, webinar today is Closed Loop Boreholes, um, the drilling and construction of them. Um, I've been involved in drilling boreholes for um, about 38 years now, I think, of uh, boreholes of all shapes and sizes. So I will do my best to uh, download some of the knowledge I've gathered over the last 20 years uh, drilling ground source heating uh, boreholes. So uh, let's move on. Um, loosely, these are the subjects I'm going to try and include over the uh, next 20 or 30 minutes. Um, we are expecting some fairly hefty thunderstorms around here fairly soon. So if I do disappear in a flash, um, you will find all of the uh, uh, webinars and uh, presentations, including this one on the Ground Source Heat Pump Association website. So uh, we'll be having a very quick look at the basics of closed loop boreholes, um, some of the references you might need, um, and also the, you know, the competences and regulation of, uh, of drilling. Uh, and uh, very importantly, we'll move on to know what you're drilling into and hence the, uh, the geology and the methods of drilling you need for different situations, grouting of closed loop boreholes, and um, a video nasty at the end showing what can happen um, if you were to stumble upon artesian pressure uh, not knowing about it. So ground source heating is a, is a fairly unique technology um, in the breadth, and breadth of expertise required to design, install and commission boreholes. Um, so I'm sure all of you have, uh, have, have probably seen this slide or versions of it. Um, a closed loop borehole is drilled um, in order to gain access to renewable heating um, on a very long term basis. Um, the drilled borehole um, needs to be stable, sufficiently stable to stay open to install a loop of uh, plastic piping into the, into the borehole which is then almost always grouted up from bottom to top um, in, a, in order to uh, provide a, a seal uh, against uh, potential ingress of contamination. I'll be talking about that in more de detail in a, in a tick. So borehole drilling um, for closed loop needs to be firstly safe. It needs to be quick. Um, we all know the budget constraints of, of all projects, not just uh, ground source. So. Um, they need to be uh, it needs to be uh, efficient and cheap, clean um, because oh, here comes my coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, because we're quite often drilling in an urban environment, um, and the drilling and installation of the U tubes need to minimise uh, the impact on groundwater should that be present and the environment. So. I won't talk too much about this because this is probably a, 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 um, a webinar of its, uh, in its own right, but uh, drilling contractor competence um, and the, the references you, you uh, would find very useful for this sort of thing. If I hold these up, um, they're probably going to be backwards because that's the way this um, Zoom works. Um, no, I'm not sure that's going to work. But So the Ground Source Heat Pump Association has adopted the Environment Agency's Environmental Good Practice Guide for Ground Source Heating and Cooling. So that's available from the GSHPA. Um, we also have the vertical borehole standard, which is uh, um, the, the, the latest issue, issue two was issued in 2017. That's another, that's one of the ground source heat pump association standards. And then there's the national sector schemes, quality management for geothermal drilling. You'll find a lot of what I've listed below there in, in all of these. So um, have a look on the uh, ground source uh, Heat Pump Association website if you don't already have these. So, regulation of uh, drilling boreholes. Um, you may know that pretty much all open loop boreholes are regulated. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that because uh, in a month's time, myself and Ian Howley will be doing a webinar on open loop systems, part of which we'll be talking about regulation. So closed loop boreholes are not regulated by the Environment Agency or CEPA or Natural Resources Wales. So that's good in one way because you know, regulation does take time. It costs money to uh, 
to satisfy the requirements of that regulation. But there's nobody there to tell you about the potential hazards that you might be that you might encounter whilst uh, whilst drilling. These might be some fairly obvious ones um, if you're drilling in an urban environment. So that's uh, underground buried services. So if you're drilling in the middle of uh, London or Birmingham, then it, you, it's all the obvious ones. It's the underground trains, it's the power, it's the gas, it's the oil pipelines, it's um, fiber optics and many, many other things. If you're in a brownfield environment, then contamination is quite often um, an, an issue you need to be aware of, at least um, whether or not it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's still there. Um, the only permit you, you may require is um, from the coal authority. The coal authority administers all of the uh, uh, historically mined areas in, in, in the UK. I think you should be able to see the map off, off, off bottom right there. Surprisingly large area of the UK has been mined. So if you go onto the Coal Authority website, you can have a look at that, uh, that interactive map and see if you are potentially at risk of drilling into uh, um, old coal workings. And if you are, then get in touch with the Coal Authority and go through the process to ob obtain a permit to drill. Um, close, large closed loop um, systems are occasionally picked up as in the planning um, process by the Environment Agency. Um, and some, and I have known a few projects which have been picked up by water companies. Um, if you're drilling a large array of boreholes near one of their um, public water supply boreholes, um, the, the long-term presence of, of closed-loop boreholes isn't an issue at all, but the drilling of them um, in some circumstances, in some uh, types of geology, may require some monitoring um, while uh, they're pumping water into public supply. Oops, sorry. Know, know your geology. This country has a huge variation of shallow and deeper geology. Um, in general, the geology gets older as you go um, north and west. Um, so we have a vast array of, uh, of hard rock geology and then plastered over the top of that from uh, the tip of Scotland down to a line from about the Wash down to Gloucester. You have various, various thicknesses of glacial deposits um, on top of that. Uh, and in some places it can be extremely thick and quite tricky to drill. Um, so uh, please obtain experienced geological advice very early in the project. We have a list of um, members on the GSHBA uh, website that can help you. Borehole design, I'm not going to talk about borehole design in different geologies in this talk. Um, that's coming up next week. That's next week's webinar. Um, but you must know what to expect with your geology in, in terms of uh, what you will get at different depths. Um, because that will decide on the, uh, the type of rig you need, the drilling methods you need, and the equipment that is required by the, by the drilling contractor. You may be drilling in all sorts of different environments and there are all sorts of drilling rigs. These pictures are all drilling rigs and they'll all do a job for you. But um, you know, one, uh, the one on the left is pretty huge, that'll uh, drill you a 5,000 meter borehole. The one on the right is not pretty huge and that'll, that'll drill you an 80 to 100 meter borehole. It's uh, horses for courses. Um, so they are, they are all available out there. Um, and uh, our member drilling contractors can be found again on the GSHVA website. So your drilling methods need to be suited to your, the geology you're going to encounter. So again, know what you're going to encounter. Get someone to help you. You can never guarantee what you're going to find when you drip drill a borehole, um, but you can be pretty sure and you can minimize your risks. You need to know the physical di dimensions of where you're going to be drilling. You know, drilling in the center of London uh, is very different to drilling in the middle of an agricultural field in the middle of nowhere. That's, that that, that um, sort of controls the, the type of rig, the size of rig, and the, the amount of uh, supporting uh, hardware and gubbins that you can have around your rig. The geology controls the rig and drilling method and the selection, the, the, the type of drilling mud or drilling fluid you need to drill. Now, when I say drilling mud, I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's the fluid you pump down the drilling rods to cool the bit and 
uh, wash the drilling cuttings back up the borehole as you're drilling. Now, um, drilling with air, compressed air, is the simplest and cheaper, cheapest method, but it's often not appropriate um, when you're drilling in an urban environment or if there's uh, you're, you suspect the borehole, the, the geology may be unstable in parts if you've got a lot of groundwater down there and if you're drilling a deep borehole. Um, other constraints, um, let's say you're drilling in, in London, um, you, would, you would normally be drilling through a thickness of anywhere between sort of 10 or maybe even 100 metres of London clay. If you try drilling that with just water um, as your um, drilling fluid, then the clay can hydrate and swell, and that will grab your drill string or um, your U-tube um, as you're installing it into the borehole. So you, know, you need to be able to select your, your drilling mud to prevent hydration of clays and also to provide support um, of formations as you're drilling through them. Um, so clean drilling methods um, utilize a drilling mud with various conditioning chemi chemicals in them, conditioning plant at the surface. So the, the, the mud is circulated around as you're drilling uh, deeper. Uh, it's removing the drilling cuttings and then it's re it recirculated down into the borehole. It's a closed system and you, it's quite possible to drill very deep boreholes um, very cleanly. Um, there are rigs out there which um, have twin heads. That means that uh, as you're drilling uh, with one of the rotary heads, um, it's, it's spinning um, to a, a string of casing behind the, behind the drill bit. So it's pulling casing down to support the formations if they're incompetent um, soft formations behind the drilling uh, bit so that you're keeping that borehole open until you reach the bottom. Um, and then uh, after you've installed, taken out the drilling uh, equipment, installed the loop, you can then remove that, that casing and uh, correct up the borehole. Um, so good practice for loop installation and uh, pressure testing. That's not, not, not going to be in this talk, but um, that, that will be uh, in, a, in a future talk. And it's all in the uh, vertical borehole standard for, uh, from the GSHPA. So grouting. Grouting a borehole, pretty much all boreholes should be grouted. Why? The, main, the, 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 the major reason for grouting a borehole is to uh, stop um, that borehole acting as a pathway for potential contaminants to enter that borehole and flow up or down in that borehole. Um, if you're drilling in a contaminated environment, um, then uh, the, the presence of grout will stop those contam the con contaminants getting into the borehole. Um, there's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but um, there's one or two <coughs> circumstances where um, you, you, you don't or can't grout completely uh, the borehole. So sealing of the borehole is its primary purpose. Um, we use uh, a bentonite grout generally. Bentonite is a clay mineral. Um, so use a bentonite grout with a, a thermal enhancer, which is often uh, silica sand, which gives it a better thermal conductivity. Um, and bentonite uh, grouts do not set. They stay semi-plastic um, so that uh, when the ground loop um, is in operation, its temperature doesn't stay the same. It, uh, the, you know, the, the, the whole technology requires the temperature of, of that uh, loop of uh, pipe in the borehole uh, to, to increase and decrease. That means the plastic pipe will expand and contract. If you have a, a hard, uh, inflexible grout, then the expansion and contraction of your, of your pipe work will cause microfractures and uh, what's, what's called a microannulus in your grout and can allow uh, movement of fluids up and down vertically in your borehole. And God forbid that if one of your boreholes ever uh, leaked um, the uh, uh, thermal transfer fluid, then uh, the, the, the grout um, in a bentonite grouted borehole, um, that, that, that fluid can't go anywhere because the bentonite um, grout is a very low permeability, 10 to the minus 9. Um, and so uh, it's performing its primary purpose. 
So the Environment Agency, although they don't regulate closed loop drilling, if you do, if you are found to allow the uh, movement of contamination from superficial deposits or from one part of a borehole into another, then under the Water Resources regulations, that is a criminal offence to allow uh, movement or uh, introduction of contaminants in, into the borehole. In some cases, you might require surface casing. Um, so casing is steel pipe, which is um, installed into the borehole. Um, and rarely this might even be permanent. You might need to leave it in there. But the, your surface casing, if you're drilling through typically glacial sediments, um, which might be you know, five, 10, 15, 20 meters deep, you might need to install steel casing to support your formations while you're drilling deeper. It's then removed um, when you've uh, installed your YouTube and are uh, doing your grouting. Now, let's just go back to that one actually. Um, so, grouting is always done but from uh, bottom to top. So, your your YouTube is installed along with your uh, tremie pipe. Tremie pipe is the tremie is the name given to the pipe that you pump your grout through. So your um, your your grout is pumped from bottom to top, so it displaces um, water, grain water out of the borehole, uh, and it displaces any air pockets, so that you're left with a continuous, consistent um, borehole full of gloopy bentonite, um, thermally enhanced up to surface. So, in some circumstances, the geology might dictate that a simple um, grouting from bottom to top isn't possible. Let's say you're drilling in fractured limestone, fractured um, uh, chalk, or other formations which are highly permeable, uh, um, can be unstable, so that if you were to install your YouTube and your Tremie, you might be pumping grout forevermore trying to fill up that borehole because um, your grout will be disappearing off down fractures um, into, into an aquifer uh, and that's not a good thing to do. Um, so in, in these circumstances um, it is uh, not widely practiced but sometimes you have to um, install gravel um, a rounded pea gravel, um, a granular media, media into the borehole up to a certain level to, to backfill those unstable, um, highly permeable uh, zones that will take away all, all the grout. So you backfill that with the gravel up to a level, um, check what your level is physically, um, and then you can grout the top 20 meters or so to give you your, your sanitary seal um, to prevent anything nasty getting in or for, to, to, to stop any uh, cross flow within the borehole. It's not acceptable just to kick in drill cuttings and uh, a couple of bags of uh, uh, gravel from the surface. Um, generally, you would need to wash your gravel uh, into the borehole, um, but could, um, provided you get a good, uh, you know, a good quality of uh, granular media, it will go down there and you can check that it's gone down there because you know the volume of your borehole pretty much and you, you know the volume of uh, gravel that you've poured in and you can then check the level that it's, that it's come, come up to. Occasionally in very hard, competent rock, um, I'm told this is often uh, the case in, uh, uh, in Sweden and elsewhere where um, the, the geology is remarkably consistent and uh, uh, very hard and uh, competent with um, grain water fairly near the surface. You can suspend your, your U-tube in the groundwater and not grout it up. However, um, you'll find um, uh, comments on this in, in, in our standard. It's quite, quite a rare thing to do here. But if you were to do that, then you really need to start your, uh, construct the top of your borehole in much the same way as you would a water borehole. So you would need uh, steel casing grouted into place um, and the, the grout uh, between the outer surface of your steel casing and the, uh, the, the formation needs to be approximately 50, 50 millimeters thick to give you a good seal uh, and that may be sort of 15 20 meters deep that, that that casing you then drill down to your designed closed loop borehole depth install your youtube 
and then you also need a method of sealing your YouTube at surface and that steel casing obviously stays in the ground forever. Finally a word about artesian conditions. Artesian uh, conditions mean um, that groundwater um, in an aquifer is at a pressure higher, high enough that if you drill into it, the water within that aquifer will flow up the borehole and flow onto the surface. So typically, you know, you know, the, uh, the little uh, picture on the right there, typically an artesian aquifer will be an aquifer sealed below a layer of clay and the, so it's the, the, the groundwater uh, will quietly sit there or it will move uh, with, the, um, with, with the, the local gradient until you pierce it with a drilling rig. As soon as you pierce it and you have a, uh, a borehole leading up through the clay, the water under pressure in that aquifer will flow up the borehole and it will flow pretty much forever unless you do something about it. <clears throat> So rule one is, again, know your geology and avoid drilling in artesian conditions. Rule two, ditto. Really do not drill in artesian conditions if you know they are there. It is, there's no benefit to be gained with them drilling closely. Obtain professional support from the beginning, get a geo report done. Uh, you need you know, geological, hydrogeological knowledge uh, even top topography. Um, you know, if you're drilling at the bottom of a a sharp valley um, with high ground all around you, and the and the, the the ground that you're drilling into extends up into that high ground, there's a pretty good risk that uh, you're 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 going to find artesian conditions. You may find um, information from nearby boreholes of uh, of people who have uh, previously intentionally or unintentionally uh, stumbled across artesian conditions. If you do need to drill um, in, in areas that, that, that may have have that risk, make sure you have um, a drilling contractor with knowledge of, uh, of good experience of, of these, experience, uh, of these uh, uh, systems and has the equipment required. It really does need experience, expertise, and the proper equipment to do this, um, to drill in our deep artesian conditions, your drilling mud, and that's the fluid in the borehole, needs to be of a density to control um, the water in the aquifer so it, it stays down there. You may need um, temporary casing, as I was saying, some rigs have twin heads, so you can pull casing down behind your drilling bit to try and seal off um, areas which may have uh, a flow of grain water. But, um, it's a, it is really only possible um, in very, very low uh, uh, pressure uh, situations or situations where the ground water is, is around about ground level. Otherwise, you can very quickly get into trouble if, you know, if, if your artesian flow washes out your drilling mud. And uh, grouting up an artesian borehole, again, um, needs some very careful thought and design as to how what, what density that mud is and whether it can control uh, hydraulically the flow of, uh, of artesian, um, artesian water. Uh, I would really say consider other options, um, open loop being one. You know, the, 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 the great advantage of closed loop is that you can use it pretty much anywhere and you can't with open loop, but um, I can't stress too highly enough how dangerous artesian conditions can be. Um, and I'll finish off. Um, with a video of um, a closed loop test borehole that we drilled um, a few years ago uh, up in Yorkshire. Um, it, was, it was all fine and it, um, it was a surprise uh, that we found such a high RTs in pressure. We knew there was going to be a low RTs in pressure there, um, but all of the geological uh, records of beer hot boreholes nearby suggested um, you know, maybe the ground water level will be around about uh, ground level. Um, we drilled, to, uh, we got down to 60 meters. Thankfully, we had a rig that had that could pull casing down behind it. Uh, and we got a flow of six bar, uh, six bar pressure at surface. That was a bit of a surprise and it took some managing. Um, so uh, because we had temporary casing in the hole, we could control the flow at surface. 
um, and we could do all sorts of things with it um, to uh, uh, in order to seal up that borehole and make sure it wasn't a, a problem in the long run. Um, the borehole was sealed quite very successfully um, and it was always under control uh, but it did give us uh, well gave me a month of very little sleep um, and required three specialist packers and some very and some specialist uh, high density grout to, to seal the thing up. Um, I'm going to attempt to play you a video of um, this is with the, with this test closed loop test borehole halfway through uh, being drilled. Um, this was after we'd hit the uh, the first artesian flow, um, and uh, this is just a video showing you uh, the power behind this sort of flow. I hope you can see that. <laughs> um, so uh, that just shows what can happen if uh, if you're not prepared and if you don't have the right equipment, then you can be in uh, in a lot of bother. Um, just like to add that that <laughs> that is now a very successful open loop system of uh, serving about 600 kilowatts uh, uh, heating and cooling capacity, um, and that will be uh, one of the things we'll be talking about in our open loop uh, uh, webinar. In a month's time on July the 25th. So uh, that's all I've got to say at the moment but uh, thank you very much for uh, listening in and um, Chris will now sort through any questions you've got and I will do my best to answer them. Yeah well we haven't, thanks very much John, that was excellent and uh, particularly getting some feedback from people about how important um, completing the boreholes properly is and we, I know at the Grounds Heat Pump Association have seen examples when it's not been done properly uh, in the recent past. Um, so has anybody got any more questions? Could you perhaps type anything in the chat so we can, uh, we can ask John? John, uh, well, while we're waiting for some questions to come in perhaps, John, um, I, it, I find it very interesting when I spoke to you previously about the uh, about the artesian conditions that those conditions were just not documented in any way. Indeed. Um, now, um, in this particular case, you know, a, a geo report was done, um, and there were quite a few boreholes nearby um, drilled in the fifties that were uh, used for um, ga gas exploration. Um, and uh, they didn't report or didn't find um, artesian pressure of uh, of that nature. Um, so um, you can be you, you can sort of understand that the client was slightly surprised when uh, when we hit that, uh, that that level of artesian pressure. So they actually went out and got a, a second opinion from a a very experienced uh, BGS geologist, and they came back with the same answer that well, yes, looking at um, the geological maps and uh, other data, we wouldn't have known it was there. Um, so, but that is very rare, very rare indeed. Um, you know, the UK is very well mapped. Um, there's a lot of boreholes and there's a lot of expertise. Generally, you can predict that yes, there is a risk of artesian in there. Either don't drill closed loop or don't go beyond a certain depth um, at, at which you will uh, encounter the artesian. That's quite often the case that you can drill to, you know, I don't know, 50, 80, 100 meters, and still be safe. Um, without piercing the, uh, you know, the pressured aquifer. Thanks very much, John. Uh, so a question in from Dan Gates. How do you deal with fractal zone stroke collapse? Fracture zones? Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, it comes down to drilling technique. Um, so uh, quite often you, um, you, you will use a drilling mud um, configured to uh, provide support while you're drilling. Um, however, in some cases, um, 
you know, that in, in highly fractured zones, it will take all of your mud. Um, so uh, in, in, in that case, in, in uh, geology that is basically robbing all of your mud, mud because it's uh, disappearing down a fracture, then you quite often will need um, to, to case as you go along. So you'll be pulling casing down behind the drilling bit to support the borehole. Um, when you get to your full depth, then um, yeah, you install your YouTube, um, you get your grout into the borehole and then remove the, uh, re remove the casing. The casing supports the borehole and, and stops or, or greatly reduces the amount of mud you lose. Great stuff. Uh, so back, back a step, a uh, question from Rich Davis. How often do you experience unexpected artesian conditions? Out of 100 installations, for example, how many times might this occur? Yeah, I thought we'd probably get this because uh, my video has probably uh, scared the, the pants off a few people. <laughs> but, um, that's, um, you know, that, that, that's the only time in um, 25 years of drilling in this country. Um, it's that, that video was, it was simply there to show you what can happen if, you, if, if things go horribly wrong. But no, it's uh, very rare. And if you get the right help from um, the people that are listed on the GSHBA website under the uh, uh, contractors and, uh, and, and consultants, um, they, will, um, they can help you and greatly min minimize uh, your risks. But as I say, you can never completely remove that risk. You can only minimize it. Okay, thanks very much indeed, John. Uh, any more questions then from the audience? In which case then, I think uh, we'll just say thank you very much once again to John for the talk this week. Uh, we'll be continuing in the fourth of our ground loop installation and design uh, series next week with a look at the geological considerations in a bit more depth. So we we'll very much look forward to that same time next week. And in the meantime, thanks again, John, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.